But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again. Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the Lord. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain him. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expanded for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me, all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything, and he had done with him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning's psalm is found in our bulletin. Let's read it responsibly, that whole verse. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my dreams and my and I am on all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips. But you, O oh Lord, know it all together. You press upon me, behind the door, and lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you, you are so good in my inmost parts, and you can get me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelous, marvelously made. Your works are wonderful, and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you. I was to be made in secret, woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. They were fashioned day by day, when as yet there was none of them. Now I need my kind of thoughts, O God, and my greatest son. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sun. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. Our second reading is a lesson from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and for the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, two shall be one flesh. But anyone you want into the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body. But the fornicator sins against the body itself. 
Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy, Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you were bought with a price? Therefore, glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. And
not a very compulsive type person. Impulsive, yes, but, but not compulsive. It's rare that I feel compelled to do something repeatedly until lately. For some reason, whether my own or something God has put on my heart, I have been felt compelled to say the Lord's Prayer multiple times every day. I've been in the habit of praying it once a day for the past 30 years, but this past month or so, I've been praying it over and over and over again. Our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters refer to the Lord's Prayer as the Our Father for its opening words. It's often prescribed by their priest to be said repeated, repeatedly as an act of contrition after confession. I never understood that. I mean, how can repeating a prayer 10, 15, even 25 times a day be an act of contrition or repentance? Now I'm beginning to see that just a bit differently. It isn't so much about repentance, but about focus. I've noticed during this past Advent that my repetition of the Lord's Prayer helped me refocus my attention on God. It certainly took it off the craziness of the present day. So perhaps when the priest tells the person to repeatedly say this prayer, it's to take their minds away from the world and put them squarely upon God. And isn't that what we need? Not just during troubled times, but always. To focus on God's kingdom. Jesus, when he stood before Pilate, was asked if he were a king. But he answered, my kingdom is not of this world. When he was tempted in the desert by Satan, he is standing on a high place and has shown all the, the powerful kingdoms of the world. And Satan says, if you will serve me, all these can be yours. But Jesus refuses. He will serve only God. Now what does that tell us about the kingdoms of man? That they do not compare to the kingdom of God. That they cannot hold a candle to what Jesus knew that God has in store for us. And what is it we pray in the Lord's Prayer? Thy kingdom come. That's to be our constant prayer. Lord, bring your kingdom to us. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let the goodness and the wonder and the supremacy of your reign, O oh Lord, sweep over us. Take us out of our painful, sinful existence and bring about that which we long for, but at the same time can't even imagine what it is like. Thy kingdom come. Too often I think we really mean my kingdom come. One of my favorite Christian authors right now is Bishop Tom Wright. He's very focused on the coming kingdom of God in all his books and many of his lectures. For right, the kingdom of God is not some pie in the sky swing by and by, but an active, breathing thing that Jesus is initiating and ushering into our existence and will one day, one day, fully, encapsulate the physical realities of earth and sky as much as it does the heavenly realities. British theologian C.H. Dodd believed that the kingdom of God is to be a realized thing, that it began with the coming of Jesus and is breaking upon us. There is an it's coming, but not quite here, so close I can almost touch it, feel to that. Now, I think 
we need to make no mistake. It's not here yet. We know that. But the kingdom of God will be God's doing. We, we cannot create it. We cannot build. We strive toward, but we cannot build the kingdom of God. Only God can make that happen. Paul talked about that in his first letter to the Corinthians. That in the blink of an eye, everything will be transformed. Everything. Now, make no mistake, that's God's doing, he says. We cannot build the kingdom of God. Only God can. But the Christian is called to live as if, as if we were already living in that kingdom. Putting aside the works of darkness, as Paul would say. Christ coming into the world is to effect change. In the words of Tom Wright, everything has changed in the coming of Jesus, and it leads us to a new kind of living. It's a kingdom of God lifestyle, with allegiance to a king as the ultimate restorer. We are his workers. To reflect that good news in a new way of life in a world that is seeking answers in profoundly short-sighted ways rather than in the way of Jesus. The world is indeed short-sighted. The world is self-centered, focused on having things its own way. It's, it's, it's the courtyard of Pilate with the world standing in the center screaming not for Jesus, but for Barabbas. Henry Nouwen, the popular Christian theologian who wrote many books, when one of them, finding my way home, Nouwen said this, keep your eyes on the Prince of Peace, the one who doesn't cling to his divine power, the one who refuses to turn stones into bread, jump from great heights, and rule with great power. The one who says, blessed are the poor, the gentle, those who mourn, and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. 